Welcome to Advanced Data Analysis 1 with me, Eric Earhart, Professor of Statistics at the University of New Mexico. In this video, we will be looking at Passion Driven Statistics, Chapters 2 and 3 on Datasets and Codebooks. So here we are at the course website. I'm going to scroll down to the first week of class, and here under the first class, we have to read Passion Driven Statistics chapters 2 and 3. We'll get that book by going to UNM Learn. So I'll click on this tab, open it in a new window. Here is our Learn website. Under Resources, we have two items we'll be looking at today. The first is the Passion Driven Statistics PDF textbook, which is 9.3 megabytes large. So I recommend you save this to your computer under your ADA1 folder and open it there. That's a PDF file. Looks like this. It is 125 pages long and we'll be jumping around in this text. There's a lot of really valuable ideas in here and we're going to select several of those. This was designed by Lisa Durker from Wesleyan College in Connecticut under a National Science Foundation grant to improve the teaching of statistics and our class is taking advantage of what they have learned. So the first chapter is an introduction I'm going to skip over and this chapter two is data sets and code books. Now, in this class, we will be looking at several large data sets. You individually will select a data set that is interesting to you. Some of your options include the U.S. National Longitudinal Survey of Adolescent Health, shortly named Ad Health. We have data from the first wave and the fourth wave measurement. Okay, So several thousand students who were in grades 7 and 12 took this survey and then every five or ten years after that they have been surveyed again and those repeated measurements is called longitudinal survey. If you take a measurement yesterday and today and tomorrow you've taken it over time. So that's over the longitude of time. That's a really rich data set. Man, if you're interested in adolescence and all the craziness that happens with all their relationships with their parents and their friends and and the substances they're using and their sleep habits, it's it's all there. Another interesting data set is NISARC, the US National Epidemiological Survey on Alcohol and Related Conditions. So if you're interested in alcohol and psychiatric disorders and these sorts of um, uh, questions, this is the data set for you. And many of my examples are going to be using this data set, um, mostly because I expect a lot of people to be looking at the adolescent health data set. There are a couple other data sets that are included in this book. There's one on Mars craters, which is a really cool set data set, but I don't think it's really rich enough for our class. And the other is Gapminder, which is about um, country level indicators around the world. And again, I think that uh, there's interesting questions to be asked there, but I'm looking for richer examples. There is one more that we've got called the Outlook on Life survey. So we'll be looking at those very briefly uh, in a moment. Now, a well-documented data set has a code book. If you come across someone who has developed a codebook for their data set, it is clear that they care that the people who use their data use it appropriately. And it saves so much time wondering what is going on in their, in their data. Sometimes a codebook is called a data dictionary. And it's got um, nothing but the complete information regarding the data set. So, for example, to the right here, we have a 
image screenshot of one such question from the Adolescent Health Wave 1 dataset. This is from the, this got cut off in the screenshot, but it says Section 22, Romantic Relationship Roster. So if you're the sort of person who keeps a roster of your romantic relationships, this is the section for you. Now the first question in this data set, or in this uh, section, is in the last 18 months, have you had spe a special romantic relationship with anyone? That variable is coded in the data set. It has, or rather, it has a variable name called H1RR1. That's the column for that data set. Uh, it is numeric, and the number one here indicates that the numeric value is expected to take only one character. Let's take a look at what those codes are. So here are the possible answers. No, yes, ref and then there's three types of missing values. Refused, don't know, or not applicable. Okay. Some people are just going to refuse to answer it. Some people don't know whether they've had a romantic relationship with anyone. And for some reason, it, it could also be not applicable. I think that is a generic um, category um, available for almost every question as a, a, a place to put a value if someone somehow doesn't answer the other ones. These are coded in this data set as, now, there are lots of possible codings. You could code it as the word no, the word yes, the word refused, and so on. They have chosen numeric codings as 0 equals no, 1 equals yes, 6 is refused, 8 is don't know, 9 is not applicable. So when you look at this variable name, h1rr1, and see a value of 1, that means yes. If you see a value of 3, you scratch your head because that is not one of the admissible values and then you have to make a de decision about what to do with that weird value that is not in this not a possible value it's something that should have been cleaned by the person who owns the data set perhaps the number three should be a number six because it's close on the numeric keypad so maybe you recode it because of that or maybe you uh, throw it out or recode it as a nine or a negative nine or something to indicate that it is not a meaningful response. The other thing that some codebooks have, which I really love, is a f frequency table. 2800 in this data set said no. 3500 said yes. And there were a few who said these other values. This particular question has two parts. There is also a flag indicating respondents who answered yes to the question above but uh, who do not have data for any romantic relationships in section 25 due to a programming error. So this can happen with these very big studies that something goes wrong. Um, I mean none of us would ever make a mistake like that but sometimes mistakes happen. So they have a flag to handle that sort of issue. In their, in their data set. So in the first week I'm hoping you'll start looking at the data sets and s start looking through the variables and um, develop ide ideas about things that are interesting to look at in that data set, formulate some questions and we'll be um, as part of your first homework assignment creating your first code book to bring together the variables of interest for your study. Now throughout passion-driven statistics there are uh, things like this. In the same Moodle text box, blah blah blah, something about your Tumblr blog. This is not, this is uh, about the class that was, that this book was designed for. It's not related to us, okay? So there's lots of ideas in this book that are great for us and some that are, are not for us. Chapter 3 is on data architecture. Now, a well-organized data set looks like the one on the right. So let me zoom in on that.
we've got rows and columns in a table. As columns, we have the variables that were measured. So in this particular data set, we have gender, age, weight, height, smoking, and race. Some of those are continuous variables, some are categorical. Along the rows of the data set, we have the observational units. So in this case, patients, patient one, patient two, and so on, are each a single observational unit. For example, patient one was measured and had values on a number of variables. M, a male for gender, 59 years for age, a weight of 175, height of 69 inches, zero for smoking status, and the race was white. And we have, looks like, 75 observations in this data set. Variables can take at least four different data types, and those can be broken uh, down, or rather broken up. Those can be uh, categorized roughly as two groups. Quantitative variables, which are numerical variables, right? These take um, like number of children you have, zero, one, two, and so on, or number of inches you are in height, right? 65, 69 inches. And so those numerical values, when you do uh, calculations on them, make sense, right? Um, I have two children, you have one child, therefore two minus one is one additional child have I over you. Um, categorical variables are variables that take some sort of name or other category that where arithmetic doesn't really make sense. So uh, race, gender, smoking are all categorical variables. If smoking means smoking status. Now of course you could have the number of cigarettes you smoke. That would be a discrete quantitative variable. I smoke 15 cigarettes a day, for example, and you smoke, smoke 3. 15 minus 3 is 12 cigarettes more that I smoke each day. Or smoking can just be smoking status. Yes, I smoke, or no, I don't smoke. In that case of yes and no's, sometimes you can code those as a 1 or a 0. We saw that in that previous example about the relationship roster. This sort of coding of 0 and 1, I like to call an indicator variable. The 1 indicates smoking status is yes. Zero indicates smoking status is no. Uh, some other disciplines uh, call these dummy codes or dumber, dummy variables, but I much prefer the word indicator variable. Um, good data sets have a variable in there that is a unique identifier. Okay, Could be your initials plus your birth date something like that. could be a serial number, a person's social security number in the United States is a unique identifier, or some sort of random number. For example, if you ever used Google Docs and you look at the insane file names that they give you, it's a super long string of about 60 or 80 random letters, capital and lowercase, and numbers. And they can generate those you know, 10,000 per second for hundreds of years, and the probability of repeating one is effectively zero. So, uh, you know, a random number generated well is, uh, is, is as good as a unique identifier. So, the first in-class assignment that we'll be doing this week is the medical records assignment, and I have another video discussing that one that, th that we are basically going to create a codebook and a data set uh, consistent with these principles. The homework for this week is to create a personal codebook for your uh, sets of questions that for your data set. And uh, another video will we'll discuss that briefly. So let's go over to the website and look at how to get 
more information about the data and installing it on your computer. So I'm going to go to the PDS data folder. Here at the top are the instructions for installing the PDS data sets, and below are the code books for the Adolescent Health Wave 1 and Wave 4 surveys, the NISARC, uh, the alcohol-related um, data set, and then Outlook on Life. So I'm going to open up the instructions for installing these data sets. And I'm going to start by scrolling past the instructions down to just above the data sets. If you need further help, help check out this web page. Now, Alan Arnhold is someone I admire very much, and he created this R package, which includes the data sets for the Passion Driven Statistics book. So great. This saves so much headache about getting access to this data. He has installation instructions here, and we've created um, a brief version of that uh, for us to use in our class. So here is our version of that. Go ahead and open our studio. In fact, I'll do that with you right now. Open up our studio. Go back to those instructions, and you should pretty much just be able to copy and paste a lot of these commands. Now, our Alan's PDS package requires the use of the development tools package, dev tools. So you're going to start off by installing those packages. So you simply copy. I'm going to do Control C there to copy. I'm going to switch over to our studio, and I'm going to paste that in. And I'm not really going to press Enter, but what if you do? It's going to start downloading a bunch of packages and installing them in your on your computer. Okay. And so it says here you'll see R download several packages and then it'll tell you where the binaries are. Now, if you are on Windows, you'll need to ins install something called R Tools. The complete installation instructions are here under this link. So you can go there if you like. Alternatively, I believe if you run these two commands and then follow the dialog box to install it, that will also work. But if for some reason those two lines don't work for you, follow the R Tools uh, instructions at this link. If you are running a Macintosh um, and OS X, you may already have the, R, the X code package installed. This is not an R package, it's a development package for your operating system. And so you may not need to run this step. What you should do after this step two and installing that, go ahead and run this line, DevTools has Devel. This is going to check whether you have the development tools. If the last line you see is true, then you're good to go. If it says false or something else, and you're on a Mac, go ahead and install the Xcode package. Okay. Now, now that the de development tools are installed, run this line to install the PDS package, and you'll know if it's installed if these two lines work for you. Now I'm going to show you a little bit of detail here. I'm going to copy this library PDS command and go over to R. I'm going to press Escape to clear that line. I'm also going to press Control L. That uh, clears the screen. All right, we have a clean slate. Now I'm going to show you what happens when you run a command. Let me put that here. Library PDS. So library is a command that will install a package. Not install a package. It loads a package so that you can run it. Let me describe how that works. In the, I have a tab here called Packages. And I'm going to scroll down to find PDS. All right, let me put it as one of the top lines. All right, here's PDS, data sets for the passion-driven statistics. That's what's installed. Now, if I click in this little box, that will actually load the package. But I'm going to get us into the habit of running library PDS. Another word for library is re require. You could also say require PDS. But let me press enter here and watch the box on the right. We'll get that check mark. So I'm going to press enter. Check mark appears. The package is loaded and we're ready to run the commands. I'm going to go back here and 
grab this line. This line starts with a question mark. That means I'm asking for help on the PDS hyphen package. And it needs to have quotes around it because it has this hyphen, which otherwise would look like a minus sign. I'm going to press help here, or press enter. And what that will do is in the help tab, which you probably have down here at the bottom, but I've moved it up at the top because I usually like to see a plot and help at the same time. In this help tab, I should get help for the PDS package. Pressing enter. There it is, the PDS package. And down at the bottom, I've got index. I'm going to click on the index, and that's going to show me a list of other help pages for each data set in this package. For example, Outlook on Life. Let me click on that. It says it's the Outlook on Life surveys, 2012. The usage is OOL. That's the data set. If I type OOL, it'll print the data set to the screen. Now you probably don't want to print the data set to the screen because it ha does have 2300 observations and over 400 variables. So, but you know, what the heck, I'll do it. OOL, press enter. It started printing a bunch of stuff and it quit after printing a bunch of stuff saying it's omitting 2200 rows. All right. And if I scroll up through this, yeah, those are the 400 something variables. In fact, the history doesn't even go back to the beginning. There's a source here that gives you a little more information about this uh, data set if you like. Now if I go back to those installation instructions and scroll down, there's for each of these four data sets a short description about what it is and um, at least how to look at the dimension of the data set. So for example, if I zoom in a little bit here, library PDS dim add health. So I'm going to copy with a control C, go over to our studio, let me clear with a control L the console, paste with a control V. I've already done the library, oops, excuse me, I've already done a library um, on this, so I just need dim add health. So add health is the name of the data set, and dim will give me the dimensions. 6,500 rows, 2,800 columns. That is a lot of data. Wow. So for each data set, we've got a, a, a description and at least that one little dimension line to see what the results are. And that's it. That's getting you started with the passion-driven statistics and the data sets. One additional comment on codebooks. Under the PDS data folder on UNM Learn, there are these zip files for the codebooks. And I recommend saving these to your computer, and I'll show you what they look like. I'll open up my Windows Explorer, and I have a data folder right here. And under there I've got, um, make this just a little bit bigger, I have, um, those instructions we just looked at, as well as the a zip file for each of the four data sets. And I've decompressed those zip files, or extracted them, into separate folders. And let's go look at Wave 1 for Adolescent Health. In here, there, there are 43 items, one for every section of uh, the data set. And there's an index. So if we open this index, we see the list of sections. Okay, And we were earlier looking at section 22, the romantic relationship roster. Uh, so if you like taking rosters of your romantic relationships or your friendship relationships, uh, that's, those are the sections for you. So let's go to section 22 and look at Okay, section 22, INH22. I'm going to press enter. And here is that code book. Let's see if we can make this a little bit 
larger. Okay, so there's the same variable that we looked at before. Much easier to read now. Okay, uh, we've got, if I, ah, that's, those are all the questions. If I page down, there's no more pages. So we get the initials. We get to know whether they were romantic and then the first initials of that person. All right, so that is what a code book looks like. Let's take a very quick look at the Adolescent Health Wave 4 code book. Okay, it's the large one, the 5.6 megabyte one. Here, everything is in one file. Section 1 is overview and demographics. Section 2, parental support relationships. And let's see, this one in the top left has 484 pages. So it goes on and on. The way I recommend navigating these code books is look at the sections that are interesting to you. Are you interested in people's diet? Are you interested in um, uh, illnesses that the people have? Or sleep? That would be an interesting one. Sleep is so important. How about um, uh, religion and spirituality? Or suicide, sexual experiences, and sexually transmitted diseases? Or I prefer sexually transmitted infections um, in terms of nomenclature. Uh, and then we've got three sections on relationships. And then relationships in detail. Man, adolescents are all about relationships. So um, if I start paging down, you can see, well, who knows, because it's way too fast. You can see the code book is very consistent throughout and uh, has all the information you'd, you'd want in a very clear and, and easy to understand way. Um, all right, so that is what I meant to cover initially. I've been Eric Earhart, still am, will continue to be this is Advanced Data Analysis 1.